we are live. I think. Yep, we we live. Good evening. Good evening, Facebook family. Good evening, conference call family. Uh, we thank God for uh, blessing us once again to be in the land of the living. It's cold outside, but the love of God burns warm in our hearts. So we thank God for the fiery gift of grace and the fiery gift of favor. Uh, as long as we are relishing and wrapped in the love of God, we'll always be warm on the inside. That's what the love of God is all about, keeping us warm, comfortable, cozy, even in the toughest of times. So we just want to thank God and welcome all who are joining, who all who may be joining. Uh, we thank God for you joining us this evening here on uh, Garfield Greater Heights Wednesday night devotion. Um, we thank God for his love, his mercy, and all that he has done and all that he does uh, for us. So we want to go ahead and uh, get started with the evening prayer. Um, as we continue to study the book of Ephesians, wholeness for a broken world, we're in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're looking at Paul is outlining the call of the Jews and the Gentiles. Paul is outlining the, the magnificence of God's work from start I would say to finish, but this portion of God's work as it, as it pertains to uh, the call of grace and the, and the destined of those who have been chosen and, and those who are of his body or of the church, or those simply the called out, the ecclesia, uh, Paul is outlining that in, in Ephesians chapter one, and he outlines it as he parallels the call of the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, so that's what we're talking about because the same thing we see in Ephesians chapter 1 is the same message of hope that the church has to share uh, today. We've got to be willing today to share this message of hope with all those of whom we may come in contact with because the truth of the matter is uh, God is still in the redeeming business. He's still in uh, the saving business. He is still sending forth his message and his plan of redemption will always be in effect until the coming of Christ. So we want to go ahead and look at this evening's study uh, from Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we want to remind everybody to keep our sister Yolanda Patterson in prayers. Uh, I do believe she's on the rise. I do believe she's doing better. I think she has a new residence. She's no longer at the Metro uh, keeping facility. So we want to keep her in prayer as well. So uh, I know we had a, a number of people who asked for prayer Sunday. Uh, I just seen my brother Powell pop up here. So we want to keep brother Powell in prayer and sister Nelson as well. Uh, my uncle down in Florida is in recovery or has recovered. Uh, from his little run-in with the invasion and the intruder. We know it as COVID-19. Uh, Paul, uh, my uncle Ernest has had an encounter with that and his wife, Joanne, as well. But he said on his last visit, it's been over 16, 17 days. He's clear he's back at work. So we praise God for a mighty and a speedy speedy recovery. Our sister Jodice making way towards uh, uh, some surgical procedures. Uh, we have um, those who have stood and asked for their loved ones, family, friends, uh, good brother Travis asked for prayers for a co-worker of his. Uh, it's just good when we see the young folk thinking about their peers, uh, even to the point of bringing them to the throne room of God and to the altar of God in prayer. Uh, that's the beauty about saints coming together. We're powerful in our coming together and we're powerful in our prayer and I know God is still in the prayer answering business. So we want to uh, go to God in the word of prayer before we tackle this evening's discussion. We're on page 11 of our book, page 11 in our book. Uh, that's where we will pick up from 
this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, your goodness, grace, and your kindness. We thank you for all that you do, all that you have done, and all that you have yet to do. We come thanking you for Jesus the Christ, the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, your anointed and your most holy one. We come to you in and by through him. No other access is available, nor is, is it acceptable in the coming to you. Please be with us this evening as we discuss the things of your kingdom in teaching and in learning, admonishing and strengthening one another in the most precious faith. Praying for all those who are ill, all those who are recovering, and all those who are in need of your comfort and wake up the loss of the loved ones. So we thank you, Father God, in Jesus Christ's name. We do pray. Amen. All right. Let's see what we got going on here. Um, we're looking at chapter one of the Ephesian letter. Chapter one of the Ephesian letter. Uh, we're looking at. Um, I think we're on question number five on, on, on page 11. Okay, question five. I think we finished up with uh, question four was the notion of being chosen and predestined strong in the conversation here. And it talks about Paul's emotional reaction to being chosen and predestined. Uh, so the writer is number four. The writer is asking that we look at Paul and Paul's emotional expression uh, to being chosen and predestined. Uh, and I think when we look at chapter one, uh, this book now is demanding us to be a little more intentional in our study. It can be casual. Uh, some people like to cheat and use the commentary, but I'm gonna encourage you to use all the help you can get as long as you know how to get to a clear understanding uh, understanding with integrity of the text in mind uh, for any particular passage any particular pericope of passages you probably can find as many commentaries as there are translations of bibles that's that's real uh, but all of them won't line up in consistency with the word of god i, I remember a good old a good old preacher used to always tell us, uh, uh, Brother Hogan used to always tell us that uh, you got to know how to eat fish. And what he meant was uh, fish has a lot of bones in it. And there's still meat in there that's good and nutritious for you, but the bones can choke and kill you. So when you're learning how to eat fish and you, you're working through commentaries, uh, you're working through all these study Bibles that has their own direction of interpretation at the bottom of the Bible on the side of the text. Uh, read it carefully and carefully read it and take it in. Make sure that whatever is being revealed or unveiled is not just another veil over your spirit. <laughs> Let me say that again. Whatever is being revealed or unveiled, you want to be careful that it's not another veil over your spirit because everything is not in line with God, even though it may have a spiritual sound or a spiritual tone to it. So uh, I'm not discouraging uh, the use of, uh, I'm more of a word person and I search phrases according to the Jewish customs, the Jewish times or the Hebrew language or the or the Greek language. And so that's really how I adapt to my study and my study guide. But commentaries are not harmful. You can glean a lot from glean a lot from commentaries. I do visit them, but it's just not my primary source of learning. So I uh, just want to encourage you in that regard as um, to studying. So he says, Paul speaking from a, has an emotional reaction to the idea or the concept of being chosen and predestined. And I think what Paul uh, is saying here from an emotional place is that he's excited about the mystery being revealed now to him or through him uh, to the church, to the call. He's excited about sharing this good news. Remember back in Acts when Paul was uh, set on his assignment 
uh, that he did still try to have a conversation with the Jews, but the Jews uh, neglected him. And, and when they were neglecting or rejecting Paul, it, it might have been hurtful to his humanity, uh, his own people turning their back on him. But it was all under the sovereign hand of God. I mean, we talked about that just Sunday. Christians have to learn how to find a place of contentment under the, under the sovereign hand of God. It might not feel good. You might not understand it. Uh, it might just not seem right. Jesus said something that just blew my mind. When Jesus says a man's enemies or a man's foes would be those of his own household. That's mind blowing because when I think of evangelism, when I think about the gospel call, when I think of sharing the good news of the Savior, I'm thinking house in the first, I look in the scriptures all through Acts and every time, well, not every time, but more often than not, when there was a conversion, the Bible quickly asked, and their household. So I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be some great work here to be able to just touch family and friends. Uh even on a broader scale, uh, touch other brothers and sisters of like ethnicity, uh, touch other brothers and sisters of humanity. And it just seems like it doesn't work that way. Everybody in your family won't answer. All your brothers and sisters of like ethnicity, they won't answer. And well, of course, all humanity, they ain't trying to hear it. So when Jesus says a man's enemies would be those of his own household, this is still all under the sovereign hand of God. So Paul being rejected by the Jews was part of God's design, guiding him toward his assignment. When he called Paul, he told Ananias that I have chosen him as a vessel or my instrument to the Gentiles. That was his call. But now here, Paul is reaching back to still grab his fellow brethren because I tell you, this is a blended congregation here, uh, blended in ethnicity or blended in uh, nationality. You have the Jewish nation and the Gentile or Gentilian nation, and you have them come together in one place of worship, the church at Ephesus. And so now he's telling them how they came about and He's excited that this has always been God's plan. As God began the new work, the mystery of all of the prophecy pointing to Christ. And what I'm going to say here might blow your mind just a little bit, but it's, it's not intended to. It's just to enlighten you. Because all scriptures were prophecy toward Christ, a prophecy toward Christ cannot exclude the prophecy of the church or the prophecy of the called people or the prophecy of the chosen. As sure as God always had the coming of Christ, the coming of God as man uh, in his design. Uh, and I always share that with you, but sometimes I don't give you passage. And I thought tonight would be a good point to give you passage. So if you have your Bible, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I, I want to show you something because I always say that if I give you something, it, it might not rest well with you, but I'm going to always do my best to put it up under a Bible or biblical theme or format. Uh, because I always share with you when we look at Hebrews chapter 2 or chapter uh, 3 and 4 or 2, 3 and 4, it behooved him that he be made like unto his brother because of man's infraction against God or man man's breaking of the covenant or man's a violation of the relationship with God, it had to be a man that put us back in covenant with God, that put us back in relationship with God, that take us out of the wrath or the violated portion of people against God. If man put us in a bad spot, it took man to put us back in a good spot. And that man is Christ Jesus. That's why I said it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, uh, that he might be a merciful and faithful priest of God to holy things, or holy things to God. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 20. The Bible says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who are asleep. I hope you're following along with me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. See? So what Paul says in Ephesians, then chapter 1, he's saying, the greatness of the work of God, the mystery of God to come down here himself in the person of Jesus the Christ and unite Jews and Gentiles into one blood-bought family in order to continue his presence on earth because the same Holy Ghost went into the Jews, went into the Gentiles. That, that's us also. Uh, even over 2,000 year la years later, the Holy Spirit is still in us like it went into them back then. And because of God being in each one of us in the person of the Holy Spirit, this is a mystical working of God now revealed. Paul's excited about it. He's excited to tell these two people, you have a room full of uh, believers and non-believers. Uh, Paul calls them in Romans chapter 1, wise and unwise, uh, barbarian and domestic or whatever the case may be. And he's saying all of them have come together as one. God always meant for it to be this way from the beginning. And this, uh, his eternal plan always included, here's, your, here's the excitement. The eternal plan of God always included you and I. Yeah, I, I wish I had a real church right about here because nobody typed amen, nobody typed hallelujah. <laughs> Paul's excited because if it talks about God chose us or me, since you're not excited, I'm excited. If God chose me before the world was formed, uh, before anything, before Adam ever, ever fell, God had me in mind. That's exciting. He knew you're going to do dope. He knew you was going to drink. He knew you're going to cuss. He knew you would have children out of wedlock. He knew you would be married a couple times. He knew you would be, you would never get married and just shack around. He knew you would, would quit school. He, he knew you would be successful. He knew you would be married one time for 200 years. He knew you would have all your children in one house. He knew you would find the Lord's church and never leave it or forsake it. Either or, he knew it. Yet in all of that, or through it all, he had you in mind. He knew you were never going to be faithful. He knew you gossiped. He knew you lied. No, you cheated. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter. And Paul's going to shape that up for us real well in chapters 2 and 3. He's going to put that in great perspective. I want, I don't want to go in too far into that because there won't be no excitement when we get there. But I am fed up. I've had enough. And y'all remember my sermons? And I try to make my sermons impressionable uh, only to the fact that it imprints something about God's word, word to you. But I try to leave something with you that you can just carry on from now on. And, and, and for the people in the church of God that act, act like they've got it all together and never ne really needed Christ, I'm done with those. Boy, bye. I'm through with that. <laughs> if people start acting like they've been good all their life and they've never uh, been that bad that they needed Jesus the Christ, it, Paul puts all that in perspective in chapters 2 and 3. No matter how good you are or were, you still needed this call of grace. No matter how right you live, you still needed this call of grace. 
I told you there's no such thing as being born in the church, but if you were church bred and church formed from the womb to the tomb, you still needed Jesus the Christ. You still needed God's call of grace. You still had to be a part of God's predestined and chosen uh, generation. And that, for me, levels all of us at the cross. Not just the physical cross of Jesus Christ, but the cross of God's calling. Where, where the grace of God touches the face of the earth, that's where it finds you and I. Remember, we're nothing but dust. So since we are the dust of the earth, <laughs> that's right, Sister Tamika by Felicia. Uh, when all these ideas and notions come crowning into our mind that we're somebody, uh, I've never been that bad, I've never did that, I've never looked like them, Paul shapes all of that up, and he puts it all in one ball. In fact, he did it in Romans chapter 3. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All we, like sheep, Paul Peter says, have gone astray. Uh, uh, but grateful are we to the shepherd and the bishop of our soul. So all of us like sheep have gone astray. There's nobody who has walked perfectly. I told you before, and I always tell you to write this stuff down because you'll forget it, but I'm not going to forget that I told you. Here it is. It ain't but two ways to get to heaven. The first way is you keep the law perfectly. If you can keep the law perfectly, and for the Gentile, you got to be a proselyte. Because you have to become a Jew or Jew-like. And if you can do that and keep the law, you can make it. I don't think that's going to work out. So the second way is through the call of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ and what God offers to us by Jesus Christ. It's the only way we can make it to heaven. That's the only way, that's the only way you and I can get to heaven. Uh, I'm going to take... I'm going to opt for the second option. I'm going to try Jesus. I'm not going to fool with that law. I'm not going to worry about trying to be a proselyte. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to be a Christian up under the grace and the call of Jesus Christ. So as Paul's excitement is all of us coming together as his sons and daughters, he had us in mind. He was, we were the focus of his love. From the birth of Seth. I just want that to sink in. When he said, I'm going to put enmity between thy seed and her seed or the seed of the woman, he had us in mind. From Seth to Noah, from Noah to Abraham, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way down to uh, Joseph and Israel, all the way back out, he had us in mind. So the author says, what is your emotional reaction? I just share it with you, mine. I'm excited. I'm excited that God had me in mind all the time. I'm excited that God had you in mind. I won't be that selfish. I got to count you in. I'm excited when I look across the aisle, I look across Facebook, I listen listen to the calls on conference call and see who's logged in and checked in. I'm excited that God had you in mind and you have been the focus of his love all this time, even from the beginning. Y'all don't sound like y'all happy. Is this too heavy for you? Because we're not doing a lot of jokes tonight. Because I want you to just think for a minute. The greatness of being predestined. Not these theologies and doctrines we hear running around where uh, God is uh, in. I remember we used to play that game. We used to play hide and seek. Yeah, not hide and seek. That's it. <laughs> we used to play hide and seek. <laughs> and we used to play this look. Or we played tag and everybody put their shoe in. And then bubble gum, bubble gum and all those kind of things to see who was it and who would be the first one to count. God didn't, that's, that's not the predestined we're talking about. That's not biblical accuracy to say that predestined means God chose him, him, oh, not him, 
her, not her, uh, not those people, this people. That, that's not how that works. Uh, the gospel call and the love of God has been spread out to all men everywhere. But because of the omnipotent, omniscient person of God, he already knew before we ever knew who would accept the call. And his plan of redemption was for all who would ever answer the call. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men. All men doesn't mean everybody. It's the call for every man that would be. He is the answer. See, that's what predestined uh, means in, in simplicity, without going into a whole lot. It, it doesn't mean you can look at somebody across the street or when you're driving down the street and you can look at them in their place and say, oh, yeah, I know God ain't called them. Or you, you got that cousin. And he and he's slinging, don't like he never gonna stop. He got like 15 kids and, and 10 baby mamas. Well, I know he wasn't called by God. He's not one of the ones God chose. That, that, all those things don't mean anything. It don't mean a hell of beans. It, they don't mean God told Samuel. He was through with Saul. He said, I'm through with Saul, but I have somebody, I have found somebody. He is a man after my own heart. Go to the house of Jesse and take this horn with this oil of anointment with you. And I want you to view his sons. I'll tell you when you get to the right one. And so that's right, that's right, Tess, and all of you, Amaya, Michelle, Wayne, Duana, yes, excited that God had us in mind even before we knew we had a mind. <laughs> even when we were acting out of our mind, God had us in mind. Uh, he told Jesse, bring your sons in here. And so he looks at all of his sons. And here comes the Adonis, the Herculean of the brothers. Samuel's like, it's got to be the guy. Six foot two, lean 220, tall, dark, and handsome. This got to be the man. <laughs> Lord says, not, that's not it, man. You're looking at somebody on the outside. I'm looking at them from the inside. Samuel's looking around. Samuel, well, I went through all, this is everybody. Jesse, you got any more sons? Oh, y'all got this little scrawny young kid, man. He, he, he out there with the sheep. He ain't no, get him in here. Samuel says, get him in here, right? Go send for him. Go sit down right here until he gets here. I need him in here. And here comes David, soaking wet, looking like he about a buck 15, buck 20. <laughs> here he comes. Samuel anoints him, and the anointing is accepted of God. And God announces his favor with David and his kingship. What was all that for, Kevin? To show us what predestined and chosen looks like, even through the muck and the mire. Because we know the story of David. A lot of us can't quote all of his accomplishments beyond the, beyond the giants of uh, the giant. Goliath, but all of us can run to Bathsheba. <laughs> that's just, that, that's notorious mind of man, but we can keep up with that bad stuff, can't we? We got that stuff on lock. Everybody can tell you the story of Bathsheba, but not too much more they can tell you about David. Oh, the story of Goliath. Yeah, we can get that one too. Excited. So when it comes to you and I, we ought to be a joyful people that God had us in mind even from the beginning or before the beginning. Let me say that. He had us in mind before the beginning. Uh, thankful to be a child of God and a daughter of the king. Maya, amen. Thankful to be a child of God and a daughter of the king. 
Uh, what a blessing it is. That's right. Excitement is the response. Uh, can't make it without him. Absolutely. I'm so glad he chose me when I didn't even honor and res he saw me before I ever saw myself. That's good news. Look at question number five. The information that was shared from verses 1 through 14, the information that was shared from verses 1 through 14, the author is asking us to formulate a statement with clarity of what it means to be chosen by God. And I just shared some of that with you, so we kind of was into that already. If you had to just give a statement of what it means, and I just shared that with you, to be chosen by God. Um, a, a good, two, two good passages come to mind uh, right off the bat. And, and, and most of you biblical students, you're already familiar with uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I don't think it can be expressed in words any clearer than Jeremiah. So the Tamika says, so glad he chose me in my weak and vulnerable state, and he chose you before you ever knew you had a weakness. He chose you, you were destined to be his even before you were ever vulnerable. He didn't, he didn't wait till we got in trouble to rescue us. He saw us rescued in his mind before we ever got into trouble. Oof. That's the omniscientness of God. All knowing, all seeing, all answers before there ever were questions, all solutions before there ever was a problem. Predestined, chosen. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse number 4. Jeremiah chapter 1. Verse number 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah's writing, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Here's what predestined and chosen looks like with a scriptural account. All of this takes place before we are who we are. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I separated you for this work. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, oh, Lord God, or listen to this, Lord. I do not know how to speak because I am a youth, I am young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere, here, here it is, everywhere I send you, you shall go and all that I command you, you shall speak do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. This is what predestined and chosen looks like. It's somebody that God, see, sister, it's my wife here, I'm calling her sister, like, like Abraham, but I ain't denying my marriage. Sister, God saw you before you were vulnerable, and he said that be no matter when vulnerability comes, I knew it was coming, 
but I am with you to deliver you. A lot of us think that God showed up. It's kind of like we look at God like the uh, executive bail bondsman or, I don't know, judge or, or Zorro or somebody. Time, or long run. I don't know how we, but we vision God as if God is sitting behind some big desk with a whole bunch of angelic uh, switchboard operators. And when the 911 call comes in, God says, who is that? Oh, okay, yeah, let's go, let's go rescue him. I'm gonna need him later. Uh, yeah, go down and deliver him, set him free. Uh, we I have some work for him to do. That, that's not how it happens. <laughs> God doesn't need switchboard operators, and he doesn't need anybody to clue him in as to what your life is going to be like. He already knew and he knows what your life is going or what's going to be like, and he still chose you before you came into being. And that's everybody. Anybody that answers the call, that's why I'm encouraging you all the time, don't allow your yesterday to rob you of your tomorrow. Because the enemy will constantly tell you, the enemy will constantly tell you how horrible you were. There's no way that can be all right with God or forgotten with God. That's right. That's right, brother. He's not a switchboard. There's no way that can be all right with God. It's, who can forget such an atrocity of actions? If God lets these things go, then God is not fair. I people say that all the time, and I don't... Some of the things we say are just... Is my, if God let America uh, do what she does without recompense, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. The devil is a liar because God acts and moves in sovereignty. If he doesn't destroy the United States like he did Sodom and Gomorrah, that's his business. What he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, he had eternal purpose for. What he does with the United States, trust and believe, he has eternal purpose for. God doesn't have to repent or apologize about anything, <laughs> whether he does anything to the United States for her wayward behavior or not. He's sovereign. He makes his own decisions and he doesn't have to confer with anybody before he makes them. Well, if I do this, if I do this to them, if I don't do nothing to them, then I probably shouldn't have did that to Sodom and Gomorrah. Who can hold God to such a fire? That's why I say we have to be careful about things we regurgitate, repeat, and we let get in our minds. Because some of it is just ludicrous. When you sit back and just let it marinate for a little while, it's like, what? He got to apologize because he doesn't burn us up. Really? So, anyway. Joy. He says, the ideal of a statement of what it means to be chosen. And I think if we're looking at what Paul says in Ephesians 1 through 14, uh, God doesn't ask for permission. He, he never has to ask for permission. What he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, he did it, he he spoke with Abraham because the Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. He was righteous. No one is equipped to challenge God about his sovereignty. Absolutely. And second, and more importantly, a sister, we thank God for Jesus, which brings grace. And I keep sharing this with you over and over and over. I don't know what's going to get What's going to take to get it through our heads? The preservation of the world, first of all, according to the book of Matthew, is God is not bringing this thing to an end, Jesus Christ said, until this gospel be preached around the world. See? So that means you Christians need to get up on your horse, giddy up. Let's go and get this message out. 
because God can't bring an end to things until this word gets out. So we got to get this word out. We got to get this word out. We got to get this word out. But second of all, what I've shared with you all the time is when you look at Revelation chapter 7, this goes back to everyone hears this gospel, and the angels are about to unleash uh, the wrath of God. Yeah, that's right, Sister Jackie. Keep sharing. We have hard heads. <laughs> we all do, sis. Some of the stuff I preach at you is bouncing right back to me. I'm trying to get it through my thick head as well. But here it is, Revelation chapter 7. When the angels are about to bring this thing to a close, and the Bible says, look at Revelation 7 real quick. If you write it down, you write it down. If you can go there, you can beat me there. Then you will meet there at the same time. Uh, the Bible talks about the four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth. And I saw another angel ascending from the heavens of the sun, having the seal of God. He cried out with a loud voice. I'm in Revelation 7, verse 3. And the angel who came down with the seal of the living God cried out with a loud voice to all the angels who were granted the permission. In other words, they have been already set as the destruction of the world. This is a revelation now by John. God has given him this fast forward. They're already poised with the four corners of the earth. We're about to fold this up table. Dinner is done. About to clear the table. But then the angel comes down, a mightier angel. And he tells them, stop right there. I'm in verse number three, two. Do, do not harm the earth or the sea. Verse number three, Revelation seven. Or the trees until we have sealed the bond service of our God on their foreheads. Foreheads is mystical. I'm not going to get into that. Don't even type and ask me questions because I won't deal with that right now. It's going to take me through the book of Revelation. But the truth of the matter is, until these things are wrapped up in the affairs of the, and the appointment and the assignment of the church, this world is going to go on like it is. But here's another thing. While we are watching the world uh, appear to unravel, God has it kept together. God has it all together. And things will go like they're going, and the saints of God will be okay even in chaos, even in all of the unrest and all of the misfortunes. And the world will continue to turn and be prosperous. Here, here it is. Because the body of Christ dwells here on earth. See, the body of Christ has to have somewhere and some means to operate. And since we have somewhere and some means to operate, then the things on this earth will continue because we have work to do. We have work to do. We have things to do. I, I spoke this afternoon uh, to this, uh, on this other format, and uh, it, it, it's, it's one of my older sermons. Some of you weren't with me at that time. It's, it, it's, it's goodbye to average, ordinary Christians. It, that day is over with. We need Christians who aren't afraid to be above average and out of the ordinary. We're not just running the meal. We don't just go with the flow. We're not just going with everybody else. You, you can't go anywhere. Type amen if you can. You can't go anywhere without somebody talking about COVID 
or what's going on with Trump in the White House. I'm sick and tired of that conversation. Can somebody give somebody answers to their soul salvation? It ain't the vaccine for COVID and it's not in the White House. But if you want to continue to be average, that's your conversation. If you want to continue to be ordinary, that's your conversation. Because that's what everybody's doing. So why not just do what everybody's doing? Why not talk about what everybody's talking about? Got to quit being timid and walk in our power. Everybody's talking about the mask. Okay, we're wearing masks. Souls are still being lost wearing masks. The mask don't stop you from talking. The mask doesn't stop you from sharing. If the vaccine never comes, guess what's still coming? Death and the judgment. <laughs> Might not never get a vaccine. Might not never take the mask off, but death and the judgment is still on the horizon. Inevitable. Yeah, your next phone call, your next tweet, your next uh, Snapchat, your next Instagram post ought not be pictures of your dogs, ought not be pictures of President, memes of President Trump, ought not be quotes from Michelle or Obama, ought to be some kind of inspiring word of God to help pull us up out of this crap that we're in called sin. This is just for you to do your own self-examination. Just take a moment and reflect on your last 10 encounters. And be honest, it's not for me. So you don't got to type in text. Oh, I was talking to somebody about the Lord. Yeah, okay. No, all right, sure. Got you. No, people are running around talking about these masks, the vaccine, President Trump here trip, or the way they're treating people, the way they're treating black people. That's all you have to talk about. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that he's putting this treasure in these earthly vessels. A treasure. I don't think the treasure is about the White House. I don't think it's about the vaccine. I don't think that's what the treasure is. I don't think he predestined or chose us before the frame of time to sit back just as worried as the world, as if we don't live in the promise. We run. <laughs> the Christians are running around like, just like all the rest of the chicken littles of the world. Oh, this guy is falling. This guy is falling. Really? And I and I and I love all of our hymns. Our, our hymns are beautiful, and we sing "Standing on the Prom." We ought to be standing on the promises. But can I give you a little bit something more secure? Can I give you a little bit something more encompassing? Something a little more enveloping? Something a little more to keep us? It's okay to stand on the promises because that's our foundation. But I'm going to suggest that you learn how to stand and live in the promise. See, when I live in the promise, everything outside of me is like water off a duck back. It just roll on because I'm wrapped in the promise. Come hell or high water, storms, winds, I'm wrapped in the promise. That's what it tells me in chapter one of Ephesians. The Holy Spirit being the last act of completion of God's mystical and mysterious working is the enveloping and the sealing of the Holy Ghost. Wrapped in his grace, wrapped in his love, wrapped in his mercy, wrapped in his favor. 
wrapped in his promises. It's all right to stand on it. I'm not arguing that. So anybody leave it to my Kevin said we shouldn't be standing. I'm just saying, don't let standing be the end of, of what it's all about. I'll tell you something. I, I, I appreciate and I thank God for my house. I, I appreciate and thank God for my car. But can I tell you a little secret? That's a little secret. I feel safer in my house than on top of my house. And it's still my house either way. <laughs> so I, I don't get a lot of pleasure out of sitting on top of my house. It's mine. I thank God for it. I can, sit, I can sleep on my roof if I like. It's still mine. It's guaranteed. It's mine. But when I come inside my house and dwell, I find greater comfort. So I'm asking all the saints, learn how to get inside of the promise of God and live there. That's the beauty of being predestined and chosen. Not only did God put himself inside of us, uh, you new creature, you. <laughs> If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Right? We went over that verse exhaustively. Old things have passed away. All things have been made new. You new creature, you. Live in the promise. Not only does he put a Holy Ghost promise inside of you, he then takes that promise and wraps you in it. The seal. Here's your statement for number three. The love God has for every child is not an afterthought. The grace, the call to grace has always been in the mind or the plan or the will of God. It was his plan to set in us and on us his favor which puts us in a favorable position for his glory and he did it all by and through Jesus Christ an act that was completed or stamped with the Holy Ghost Let me get that to you one more time. Number five, a statement of what it means to be chosen by God. The love God has for every child is not an afterthought. God didn't look down on us and see a pity and say, oh, yeah, you know what? I really love them people. I love my creation. I'm going to have to do something about Jesus. Come on, son, I'm going to need you to get ready to go down there. We're going to have to do something. It's not an afterthought. But his grace and his call to grace has always been in his mind. It has always been his will and his plan, not only to pour out his favor on us, but to put his favor in us, which, was, which would position us in a place for his glory. And he did it all by and through Jesus Christ. That's in 1 through 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. He did it all by and through Jesus Christ. And he completed it or completed his act or formulated his, his uh, call of grace by the seal or the stamp of the Holy Ghost. The church could reach greater heights and soul if we knew how much power we have within If you're on this Facebook, if you're on conference call, like Paul told the Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, <laughs> by the mercies of God, to be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might. Be strong in your calling. Be strong in your predestined state, you new creature, you. Walk in power. You can be confident without being cocky. You can walk in anointment without being arrogant. You can walk boldly without boasting. You can walk in pride without being prideful. This is where we need to be. Number six next week. Number six next week. Please read Ephesians 1. Spend some time with Ephesians 1. And if you're time, if you don't have anything else to do, you get bored, you might as well go and start chapter 2. You might as well start, take a peek at yourself. <laughs> Not nobody else. Take a peek at yourself and what God did for you in chapter 2. Yeah, finish reading. Read chapter 1. Go back through it a little bit more meticulously. A little more deliberately. And then navigate on through chapter 2 to see what's ahead. Navigate to chapter 2 to see what's ahead. We got to keep your, your vine in prayer. We got to, she wanted us to sing a song. I mean, uh, not, I'm sorry, Yvonne, uh, Yolanda. And we didn't get you this week, sister, but we will start uh, trying to do that a little bit more. Sometimes, you know, we're doing things so I don't know. Every, everybody sings songs on Wednesday nights and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. We just do things so differently here. But if somebody uh, could be encouraged or uplifted by a song, we, we, by all means, we want to be encouraging and uplifting. So uh, if God says the same as we meet next week, get here on time so you can be a part uh, be sing a song, a verse or two with us um, so we can uh, just have that little moment of fellowship prior to going into the lesson. Uh, uh, Maya's asking for prayers for all the leaderships at every congregation. Amen. That's amen. That's a beautiful prayer. Uh, we want to keep uh, Sister Yolanda, that's what I was saying, in prayer, as well as our Sister Yvonne, uh, our good friend of the family, uh, keep her and our prayers as well. Uh, Sister Johnny, uh, we want to keep Sister Johnny in prayer. Um, oh, sister, oh, sister from uh, the saints, child of God, daughter of God, a mother to many. Uh, we want to keep her in prayer. Again, uh, Brother Powell and Sister Nelson, uh, we want to keep them in prayer as well. Continue to keep Brother Ben and all of his family, his children, his grandchildren, uh, we want to keep being in prayer. Uh, also, uh, my mother, keep her in prayer. And, and even her husband, husband Brother Ted Cotton, want to keep that fam that house in prayer. Uh, yeah, we can maybe have a song in prayer at night, uh, Maya. That's a good idea. Uh, the brothers are on, on tap, so they are looking to that and see how we can materialize and bring that into being. Um, and we want to keep... Uh, the saints of God. Y'all think about some of the saints. We want to keep uh, our sister Cheryl Irvin, uh, Cheryl in prayer, our sister Cynthia Martin in prayer, uh, sister Traby. We want to just keep keep the saints in prayer. Somebody you haven't seen, just pray for them. And like Hannah. And Laura Cohen. Laura who? Cohen. Lauren, Lauren Cohen. Coleman, we want to keep her in prayer as well. Keep all of our young folk in prayer. And guess what? Keep all of our older folk in prayer. By the way, keep all the middle folk in prayer. <laughs> Just keep them all in prayer. Like Hannah. Whatever is bothering you, you know, you know where to take it. I'm not against sharing with one another. Sometimes you need to bounce things around. But Hannah didn't bounce things around. She kind of just was internalizing it to the point where when she was going to worship, y'all thought I was going to miss that opportunity, not on your life. Get your butt up and worship. Oh, that's a bad word. 
Saints, could you please come to church and worship with us? <laughs> could you please come to church and worship with us? So I can't make it. I'm not coming out. Can you please open your site at 1 o'clock, 1.15, and be ready, sit and sit down at 1.30 to worship with us? As a, in a congregated effort, take your prayers to the Lord. Sister Marjorie, thank you, Ann. Yes, keep Sister Marjorie in prayer. Thank you so much. Yes, keep Sister Marjorie in prayer. Yes, yes, yes. Keep Sister Marjorie in prayer. Here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, mercy. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for calling us even before we were ever formed, your plan of redemption, your plan of salvation, the sealing and the gifting and the enveloping of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, God. All the prayers that have been submitted and asked, all the petitions and requests, we ask and we commend them unto you, Lord, for we know that you are able. Please be with the Garfield Greater Heights family and all those who are in close connection and contact with her. Please allow the spilling of your favor and the pouring out of your anointing to flow over, enveloping and touching them just as well. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus to Christ. Please be with us. Keep us until our next time of gathering. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. God bless you and y'all have a great evening.